just before uh, we get started, I'll just do a couple of um, sort of ground rules. So you'll notice that your mics and cameras are off. Um, that is just simply because there's obviously so many of us here tonight. Um, it's just to make sure that the connection is all OK. Um, we had over 100 questions submitted prior to tonight, which is fantastic. Obviously, it does mean we have a lot to get to. Um, so we do hope your questions were were answered. Um, if you have any questions or comments during the event, if you just pop those in the chat, uh, you should see that chat button at the top of the page. Um, we have a few questions lined up that you sent in in advance. So um, we do, all, if, we, if there is time at the end, we will get to those and, but hopefully we will have already covered those. Um, the event is being recorded, so we will be able to share the recording afterwards. So if you want to watch it back or share it with any friends, um, by all means, please do. Um, just before I hand you over to Kathy, um, just to introduce and say a little bit more about who we are. Um, so we are, I'm from the National Landscape team, as is Emma. So um, a National Landscape previously was known as an area of outstanding natural beauty. Um, essentially, that refers to an area of land that is protected because it is deemed nationally important because of its natural beauty and its special qualities, similar to that of a national park. Um, the role of the National Landscape is to conserve and enhance the natural beauty of the area. Um, there are 34 national landscapes in England uh, and two on our doorsteps here in Suffolk and Essex. So the Dedham Vale National Landscape uh, stretches along the Stour um, from Catterwade to Bures, and that includes um, most famously Dedham and Flatford. And then the Suffolk and Essex Coast and Heaths National Landscape uh, stretches along the Suffolk coast um, all the way from Kessingland up in North Suffolk down to um, the Stuart Estuary. So that includes Ravness and the southern shore of the Stuart and encompasses all of the Suffolk, the East Suffolk coast. Um, so most famously places such as Alborough and Southwold. Um, so in those areas, we work to um, conserve and enhance the natural beauty. So some of the things we do will be like river restoration, tree planting, hedgerows, heathland management, uh, beach cleans, volunteering tasks, uh, guided walks and grants. Um, so hopefully that introduced a little bit more about who we are so you know who this strange man is talking to you now. Um, but I know you will come here to learn about hedgehogs, um, not listen to me. So I will hand you over to Kathy, who will tell us all about the beloved hedgehog. Over to you, Kathy. I think you're just on uh, mute, Kathy. Got to get right. Teams. Okay, can you? Oh, we go present. We can hear you. Yeah, good. And can you see? Um, the... We can. Excellent. Okay, so I'm going to do a pit stop tour on some sort of features, some things that are about are special about hedgehogs, um, some of the um, pressures that hedgehogs are facing and um and then a little bit about what we can do about that to help them and emma will pick up um on that a little bit in a bit more detail so firstly um the sort of thing about a hedgehog is that actually they're a mammal so they give birth to live young suckle their young but they're a fairly um, unsophisticated if you like mammal they've got a fairly simple um denture teeth um, these bottom teeth though are a little distinctive little front teeth stick out slightly which means they haven't got a very strong bite um, but they're a very ancient species um, and the mammals that are closest to them in uh, that we have in the UK would be a shrew and a mole so although they don't have the spines these are other creatures that feed on um, invertebrates, um, mini beasts, very often referred to. 
And of course, the thing that we know most about hedgehogs, the thing that's most distinctive is their spines. Um, that's a really um, handy thing for us to know about. Um, and for us in particular, when we're asking people to record hedgehogs, there isn't really another animal that looks anything like it running loose in the, the countryside in England. Um, so it makes it a distinctive creature. And this is their defence mechanism. This is these spines. So you can see one um, curled up there. Um, it pulls forward its sort of muscles. It's got very baggy skin and it uses its muscles to pull that skin and, and totally enclose its body within um, and really effective mechanism um, to avoid predation. Um, and somebody um, has taken the trouble to count the number of spines um, and made it on average 5,000, but they can have more than that in a very large hog. Um, so the, the species of hedgehog we have um, in the UK is the Western European hedgehog. And this is its, that sort of yellow mustardy colour is its rough distribution. And then you also see the map of the distribution um, in the UK. Um, so the dark colour is where most of them are. And you can see we have quite a number of hedgehogs in East Anglia. There's quite dark there um, and then centred again around London. Particularly the darker colours tend to be associated, even though East Anglia is quite a rural county. Um, we see quite a predominance of records coming from urban and suburban areas. Now, as a nocturnal animal, it relies particularly on its hearing and smell rather than its eyesight. Um, so really, really important um, and very um, able to pick up very high pitched sounds in particular, perhaps higher than we can pick up. Really, really important for them to, to navigate around and they learn um, to, to navigate. They learn the features of their environment. Um, based on particularly on smell and hearing. Um, the other thing to say is that they're generally solitary, although they will form loose, sol loose family groups, um, but they're not territorial, so they don't defend an area. They have home ranges, large distances that they travel, um, but and they will compete over resources, particularly food bowls, but they don't really have a defensive territory like some animals like perhaps a badger might have. So the other thing that about hedgehogs, this is a little baby hedgehog at the top there, always intrigues people as to how the mothers give birth to such a spiny animal. Um, but the prickles very quickly develop after it's born. Um, the breeding April to September time, but probably peaking around May is the first time where we see big numbers of baby hedgehogs. Um, four to five in the average litter, but only three, perhaps on average, about three will actually live to become independent at, at around six weeks. So they become so they, they become independent quite quickly, but actually won't be fully mature until about the age of two. Um, so quite a sort of slow time they need to survive to become able to breed themselves. So this, there is this real drop off a cliff, high metal, infant mortality in hedgehogs, sadly. Um, and, and this isn't necessarily due to these predations. This is probably more to do with them um, just learning their way around and to do with the food, finding food and things. Um, but they do have natural predators. Um, so badgers, which we'll come up back to again. Um, dogs and foxes, and also I've been told rats as well when they're hibernating in particular. Um, but predation is not the main um, thing that's affecting hedgehog numbers more widely. Um, so the other important thing about hedgehogs is that they make nests um, throughout their life, really. So in the summer, pretty flimsy, ter temporary th nests um, that they might be in for only three days, maybe a couple of weeks, they might return to them, um, maybe in some long grass. Um, but then their nursery nests, they need, obviously those young are not going to leave the nest till they're about four weeks old. 
Um, so they need to be able to be a little bit more robust and structure is really important because they're making nests out of leaves. If you imagine a sort of windy day, you don't want your nest material all blowing about. So um, so things like brambles, rose bushes, shrubberies, but they'll also use an, under sort of um, decking and things as sheds as well. And then winter nests, even more important to have a robust structure. They could be in this nest for a couple of months, although they typically do move nests during hibernation. So it's not unusual for them to move, um, but these nests are really quite substantial. So we're talking um, sort of uh, 30 to 70, 60 centimetres in diameter. So if you can imagine that, that's sort of two rulers worth. It's quite a big nest. Um, and they'll take in lots of leaves, move around in the middle to, to get the leaves all layered, nice laminate structure, um, up to 20 centimetres thick. And that's really important because that's going to maintain a stable temperature for them whilst they're hibernating. Um, their food, so whilst they're active, um, they're, they're, they're sort of selective but non-selective. They'll eat a wide variety of food, invertebrates, mini beasts perhaps to you and I, are their main food source, but they will eat carrion, um, they'll eat rotting fruit occasionally. But things like caterpillars, earthworms, beetles, really, really crucial in the diet. They will take slugs, which is what they're most typically known for, so long as they're not too slimy. Um, millipedes weirdly avoid um, wood lice. Um, so I guess they must taste a bit, you know, unpalatable for some reason. Um, the other key important thing about um, hedgehogs, and this is really important in terms of what our understanding of how, what we can do to help them and why, um, why, why perhaps in some cases they're having a hard time. Hedgehogs move and they move quite a substantial distance. So this is um, a hedgehog that was tracked in a, a suburban area um, and they reckon on average a male hedgehog might go two kilometres a night. Um, so that's five times round an athletics track, if that's easier to visualise. Um, and other other ways of thinking of that is for a viable population of hedgehogs, they're estimated to need um, the equivalent of 142 football pitches of, of land. So a really big area that they, they need um, to, to move around to food that feed to to for their social interaction to find their food to find their nesting um, opportunities. So the another key thing about hedgehogs is they're one of our few genuine animals in the UK that hibernate. So we can include bats and dormice in that too. Um, and hibernation is more than just sleep. It's triggered by cold weather over a number of days, and it's a way of coping with the lack of insect food that they largely rely on. Um, the actual dates they go into hibernation and come out of are, are, are quite broad. It's, it's most to do with food availability and temperature. And I've heard of people already are sending me records that they've seen hedgehogs out this spring already, which is you know fairly early, but we've had a fairly mild spring. So whilst they're in, in hibernation, their heart rate drops so and their body temperature drops to pretty much match that around their environment. But they might pick up their metabolism to avoid actually freezing if it gets very cold around them. And they might not breathe for an hour or two. That's quite normal for a hibernating hedgehog. And then they might take a little burst of um, rapid breaths just to get um, perhaps the toxins cleared out of their body um, or um, it, it intervals. So, so this is very specific metabolic processes, hibernation, absolutely reliant on brown fat, which these hibernating animals have. Um, and it's really important that we try not to disturb them when they're hibernating. So we sort of referred to a little bit in that map of the UK, if you can remember back, the most of the, the dense blue 
um, dots were in the more urban and suburban areas. And that's the typical picture of distribution of hedgehogs we see is that they prefer these areas less common in agriculture, pastoral woodland and villages particularly important for nesting. Again, tend not to find them in moors, plantation and wetland areas. A lot of what's thought to be key to where we find them is nesting opportunities. And I've alluded to the fact that hedgehogs have been having a bit of a bad time. So we've seen declines over a long period of time. In urban areas, the latest data is showing that their numbers are more stable, perhaps even improving. Rural populations, though, still the numbers are low and still we're seeing big declines. The reasons for these declines are, why, uh, you know, lots of pressures on hedgehogs. Some of these are perhaps factors that us as individuals will have difficulty um, addressing, um, but there are some things that we'll come on to which really all of us can have an impact on. So agricultural intensification has been happening since probably the 40s and the drive to become self-sufficient in food um, and, and changing agricultural policies. More recently, um, there's been a lot of effort by landowners and help from people like the um, National Landscape and our farmer clusters have been working hard to restore um, and put back hedgerows. But, but, you know, if we think about the name of a hedgehog, hedgerow, hedge, hedgehog, um, typically it's associated with hedges, so really important to them. Um, there's been a lot of concern or a lot of talk about whether the increase in badgers could be affecting hedgehogs. We know that historically they've coexisted for thousands of years, but they could be exasperating that problem of habitat degradation and fragmentation and perhaps more likely to encounter one another. We know they can predate hedgehogs. We know they can displace them. Hedgehogs will avoid foraging where there are hedgehogs. Um, so, so there could be an impact, impact there. And this is coming on to some of the things that perhaps actually we can do something more about. So you want hedgehogs in your garden the one thing is if you've got a brick wall like this sadly hedgehogs are not going to be able to get in they can climb but you know a steep wall like this without much grip it's not going to be easy road casualties sadly road casualties are often used as a proxy for how many hedgehogs are about a sad way of understanding um but yes, yeah, something again is quite difficult for to, us to individually do much about. But there are there is an option of signage out there, and certainly of informing your neighbours um, and trying to, to get them to be a bit more hedgehog aware. Um, something that comes up a lot is people understanding when to step in, when a hedgehog might need our help. We don't want to rescue hedgehogs unnecessarily um, because we know they get stressed. We're, though we know rescued, rescued hedgehogs do have good outcomes, um, but equally, if, a, if we rescue a hedgehog and actually it's a mum like this one that's collecting um, nesting material, we don't want to go rescuing it and then finding actually we're depriving its young of its mother. So we have to be quite careful. But there's some really good advice out there. So we're looking at hedgehogs that are lethargic. Hedgehogs don't sunbathe. So if it's stretch out and looking a bit like it's not going anywhere. Warbly hedgehogs, that's not great look. It obviously injured. Hedgehogs sadly get injured by things like strimmers. Um, if the, something bad has happened to the mother, the, the hog, hoglets, the babies, might squawk or squeal or peep like a, a fire um, smoke detector, I've been told. Um, or they've got lots of flies around them. Again, perhaps a sign of injury. Obviously, if they're trapped, they might need rescuing. And you're looking for purposeful behaviour. So this picture, hedgehog is quite purposeful. So it doesn't need rescuing. 
if you're at all concerned, then phone the helpline for the British Hedgehog Preservation Society and Suffolk Wildlife Trust also suggest um, Suffolk Prickles are very good. And they, they've got a network of other re hedgehog rescue people. Um, there are simple things that we can do to try and help prevent hedgehogs getting getting you know into some of those difficulties so something perhaps most widely known is the big, the the bonfire one don't build your bonfire too far in advance check at the last minute use a torch um ideally move your your bonfire ponds hedgehogs can swim but not indefinitely so make sure you've got a shallow edge or ramp so they can get out so a nice, some nice straightforward things that we can do there. I said earlier, hedgehogs eat insects and invertebrates. Now, if we're putting pesticides out, thinking that we're getting rid of, you know, things like aphids, green fly or slugs, then we're removing the very thing that hedgehogs eat. Um, so try and think of alternative ways of controlling um, the garden pests or things that you might think are a problem. Now, some people use supplementary feeding of hedgehogs and that, that can be helpful, particularly in the autumn, and it can bring us closer to hedgehogs. People typically put out trail cameras and, and enjoy their hedgehogs. Do use a meaty cat or dog food. Um, and this is where hedgehogs can be quite selective. Um, they, they will be particularly picky about the kind of cat or dog food. They really like meaty ones. Shallow dish of water, really important in, in hot, dry weather. Um, and you can put it within a container with a tunnel um, to help prevent cats or foxes getting there first. Um, hedgehogs can compete. Coming back to that territorial thing, generally they're not competitive, but they can compete over food. So if you've got uh, multiple hedgehogs in your garden and having several bowls of food is useful. And also remember hygiene, um, bringing hedgehogs together a regular place can mean that they're likely to swap um, diseases. So um, or the food. So do do clean out your feeding stations. This is the, the approach I tend to personally take is having those wild patches in your garden where the, the soil is um, nice and loose. So things like earthworms, it's not compacted, lots of mulch, lots of moisture. We know long vegetation hold, supports a lot more invertebrates than close mown. Um, so a little bit of a wild area. Um, and then you'll get lots more caterpillars, lots more earthworms. That's where your hedgehogs um, are really going to benefit. And again, natural nesting places. We we described these a little bit late earlier. Um, you can make artificial homes as well, and, and people have great joy in doing that. Um, just be careful to avoid the wicker ones or igloo ones. Um, but But there are lots of good options there for people. Um, and we talked about those impermeable fences, didn't we? How those barriers to hedgehogs coming into your garden, they only need a very small gap, about the size of a CD case to get in or under a gate. Um, but remember, the more gaps, the more likely they are to move between gardens rather than to being pushed out and to use roadsides and become vulnerable to traffic. Um, there are now gravel boards that have got ready-made holes in um, and you can perhaps talk to your local contractors and, and try and get them more aware as well. And also you can, as an individual, if there's planning applications coming in, you can make comments on there encouraging them to put in um, hedgehog-friendly highways. How do we know we've got hedgehogs? Well, we said they were nocturnal. Um, they often don't come out till God midnight. Um, sometimes they'll come out an hour after sunset, but many of us are sort of tucked up in front of the television by then or in front of a nice webinar, so we might not see them. But we can look for field signs. We can look for those typical crunchy droppings. They've got little beetle cases in very often. Uh, we can use footprint tunnels, which are great fun where you put the food inside um, and then you use some like um, charcoal powder, graphite uh, for the footprints to be uh, recorded on the paper. 
Um, and indeed, you can use trail cameras, which increasing number of people are doing. And if you happen to see a hedgehog um, alive or dead, or if you happen to have made a hedgehog friendly garden, then there's some really good um, place, Hedgehog Street, fantastic resource um, for recording um, your hedgehogs, or indeed on the, on the Suffolk Wildlife Trust have got a, a map where you can record your action for wildlife, be it for hedgehogs or other species. Um, and so just to summarise there before we move on to Emma that will go into a little bit more detail how we can work together. So it's about providing hedgehogs what they need in their environment. They need feeding opportunities. They need somewhere to nest. They need a connected network that's social, those two kilometres a night. Think of that distance they need to be able to move and that habitat they need. We can reduce habitat hazards. That's really important. Um, and we can record them. That helps um, conservationists, helps all of us understand um, how hedge, hedgehogs are using their environment um, and what's working and what isn't. Um, so thank you, everybody. And I can see the questions popping into the chat, which is fantastic. I'm going to pass over to Emma now to explain a little bit more what we can all do to help hedgehogs. That was great. Thanks, Kathy. Absolutely fascinating stuff. OK, <clears throat> can you see that? Can you see that? Yeah. Sorry. Yes. Yeah. Sorry. OK, Perfect. just fantastic. Right. Um, good evening, everyone. I'm just. Starting from the beginning. There we go. OK, uh, thanks, Kathy. That was a really excellent talk and very, very informative. It's great to know a bit more about the biology of hedgehogs and what they need to survive and what we can do as individuals to help hedgehogs. My talk is very much going to be about collective action and what we can do together to help hedgehogs. As Kathy's mentioned, hedgehogs travel up to two kilometres a night and that's for their food and also to find a mate. So increasing connectivity and also that nature friendly garden are key to their survival. They can't just survive in just one garden. So we need to make sure that we do work together as a community and collectively to ensure that future populations are increasing. So I'm going to, just going to talk to you a, a, um, a little bit about the different ways that you can take collective action. There's all different sorts of levels. And the most easiest level is on a street level. And, you know, that's uh, where you can talk to your neighbours and you can say, I really would like to make a hedgehog highway. And the way to do that is to make some holes in your fences. In, and it could be a gap under a hedge or it could be a gap under a gate or even in your fence panels and barge boards. So, yeah, talking to your neighbours is one of the easiest ways to create a hedgehog highway. I recently went to Stratford St Mary in Suffolk and I noted as part of a planning consent for a residential um, street that they all had to have um, hedgehog holes put in the fences. So that was great. So that means the hedgehogs can go from one garden to the next garden really easily. So yes, what Cathy was saying about, you know, consulting on planning applications is really, really important. Um, some other groups also um, create hedgehog projects around recreation grounds or an open space. So it could be a park or it could be a school. And again, that's a really good way of working together to create lots of space for hedgehogs. It, most importantly, is trying, the most important thing is to try and get hedgehogs to be off roads, not on roads. And if we can get them going from one garden to another garden to an open space, then that's great. A lot of villages now have got their um, wildlife groups or a green group, and many of those wildlife groups and community groups are looking at different um, sort of wildlife projects that they can do. I've worked with quite a few in the Denvale National Landscape, one of which was in East Burkholt, and we set up hedgehog friendly village project there. And that was really, really good. And I'm going to talk a lot about that um, as we go along, but also there's lots of other community groups. Boxwood Wildlife Group has just set up a hedgehog 
um, Help for Hedgehogs project and in Debenham also they've just set up a hedgehog friendly project uh, village project so yeah loads and loads of um, villages are doing this now and also in towns as well particularly there was a massive big project that Suffolk Wildlife Trust um, ran and that was in Ipswich and they 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 did a very successful project there so lots and lots of ways that you can get involved in helping hedgehogs um, not just as an individual but with with your local community just want also to mention hedgehog street as Kathy has also mentioned it's a fantastic um organization it's it's sort of run by the uh, the pts the protection for oh gosh i'm forgetting the name now i'll have to come back to it endangered species protection for, for endangered species of which obviously hedgehog is one but you can sign up there as a hedgehog champion and if you become a hedgehog champion you can access loads and loads of resources which will help you set up a hedgehog project and also get lots of advice there as well so where to start if you have an idea about setting up a hedgehog project where do you start so i'm quickly going to go through this diagram on the left and talk about how you can set up a hedgehog friendly village project and this is what i did when i was um, in east burkholt so i had an idea about wanting to set up a hedgehog project i looked to see where in the dead and vale there were quite a few hedgehogs and east burkholt had a good population so i thought right I'm going to see whether there's anybody in East Burkholt who wants to set up a hedgehog friendly village project. And there was a community group there called East Burkholt Futures and they were really up for it. So, yes, so we got talking and we got thinking about what sort of project we wanted it to be. And we wanted it to be a, a, a village wide project, not just on streets, but the whole village. So we basically did lots of promotion and communication and discussed how we were going to do it. We produced a communications plan. And we basically uh, created lots of resources for people so they knew what was happening and when. It's really important to do that. Uh, we also did a sort of skills audit as well, which was quite useful because we wanted everybody in the village, if they wanted to be involved, to get involved. And everybody has different skills. So we, we, we put together a skills audit as well. And obviously, as part of you know knowing what to do, we need to know where there are hedgehogs and also where there are holes and fences and things like that and where there aren't holes and fences and things like that. So recording surveying is a really, really important. So that was another part of the planning stage, looking at how we were going to monitor and record. And then there's also the timeline as well, because as Cathy said, hedgehogs are nocturnal and they're also hibernating. So we need we needed to think, well, how are we going to run our activities around this? And also we were we needed to think, well, did we need any funding, any money to help us run this project? So there was lots and lots of different things to think about in the planning stage. And these are all sorts of ideas that I'm going to talk about now in a little bit more detail. So one of the most important parts of a project um, is communication. And we had lots of communication volunteers. It's really, really important to plan how you're going to promote your project. We need to let people know what's going on and how that they can help. So obviously there's lots of different types of written media. So I wrote lots of articles once a month um, in the parish magazine. And um, there was also information on their website. And there were lots and lots of um, things that went up on social media. I would suggest social media is the best way of trying to get people involved in what you're doing, keeping them updated. And it was a great way for people to upload pictures of hedgehogs and their homes and all the different things that people could talk about to do with hedgehogs could be put up on social media and it's really important also to talk about that seasonal messaging about you know checking your bonfire before you light it that sort of thing you know checking long grass before you cut it so these are all sorts of messages that you could put up on social media and I also put in sort of the newsletter as well one of the things that we did in East Burkholt was to produce a postcard and this postcard talked about the hedgehog the hedgehog in the Denville national landscape is one of our priority species so we really wanted to tell people about hedgehogs and what was happening with the population of hedgehogs and we gave them lots of ideas of how they could help um, you know protect hedgehogs in terms of lots of hedgehog friendly gardening tips all of which sort of Kathy has mentioned so we had a group of volunteers that um, 
got together and they distributed these leaflets, these little postcards. So that was a great way of trying to engage people and um, get that information out there. So obviously not everybody is on social media and not everybody reads the parish magazines. So posters are a really, really good way of letting people know what's coming up, what you're planning, what events are happening. So we did a, a Hedgehog Friendly Village um, talk and walk. Both Kathy and I did a talk and walk. And um, we also, um, I got lots of young people to produce posters and they put we put them up around the village. Again, got volunteers to do that. So yeah, think about when you're doing your sort of communication plan, how you're gonna, who's gonna do some of these activities. So we had communication volunteers. So um, the next poster on this this slide is 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 a is a is a project that's going on in Holbrook, and they have a a, um, a project going on around a field called Reed Field, and they're having a celebratory day coming up. So as I say, lots of different types of um, projects out there, and communicating what they're doing is really really important in order to engage people and get people to attend and find out more information. So. We really wanted to engage the whole community, so we also had some event volunteers and those event volunteers um, have been supporting us in all sorts of different ways. So in some villages, I know that um, the volunteers are going out and they're talking to lots of village groups such as the WI, such as um, the um, the parish after a church church service, they're going to go and talk about, you know, hedgehogs there and their hedgehog project and how people can get involved with the project. I did a talk with this, with the Cubs and I also did a, a talk at uh, the local school and that was great in terms of engaging young people. The Cubs made a load of posters and they were laminated and put around the village. Again, it's just making everybody aware and in having that community engagement is really, really important. So everybody is on board with what you're trying to do. And as I say, Kathy and I did a, a talk on hedgehogs and how the village could get involved. Again, another different way of involving volunteers. They're setting up, you know, for events and also providing refreshments. Not everybody can do everything. So, you know, some people are quite happy just to support by doing backup event things like refreshments. One thing that was really successful was um, at the open gardens and a lot of villages do have open gardens and what was really nice was those people who opened up their gardens, they highlighted the fact that their garden was hedgehog friendly and um, that was really important. So people weren't just looking at lovely gardens, but they were also looking at gardens that were also nature friendly. As part of the talk that we did, Kathy and I, we also did a nature friendly garden tours. And that was good because people who attended the talk also went to gardens where, again, it was all nature friendly. And the really good way, because, you know, a lot of people don't know what that might look like, leaving your garden a little bit untidy. But actually, by going and having a look at gardens, which are great to um, to, to look at, they're also great for wildlife. So it's good to see other people's gardens and see what they're doing and get inspired. Um, also, a lot of villages have fates and in East Burgot they had a horticultural show and the, the East Burgot uh, Futures Group had a whole stand on hedgehog friendly, um, you know, the hedgehog friendly village project. So again, lots of different ways to engage people and, and a good way is through events. Engaging younger people uh, is really, really important in terms of getting them to access nature and to understand, you know, the importance of nature around them. And, you know, uh, particularly with, with those 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 um, animals that are in, in trouble. So we did a lot of family days, particularly down at Flatford. We had Flatford Nature Days and loads and loads of fun activities, lots of craft, lots of making hedgehog newsies, lots of also getting young people to pledge what were they going to do once they found out information there were trails there were all sorts of things that they could get involved in and learn about hedgehogs and then they pledge what they were going to do in their own gardens so yeah lots and lots of um, different ways that you can engage and again those event volunteers are really important in terms of getting the message out um, one of our um, hedgehog champions in East Burko um, also is quite keen to to produce a little YouTube video. 
I'm not going to start this off now, uh, but if we have time at the end, we can come back to this. But it was a great way to, again, show people how to go about, you know, doing nature friendly garden for hedgehogs. So we'll come back to that if we have time. As Cathy mentioned, and I've also mentioned, you know, that that sort of, you know, making sure that we record what we're doing is really, really important. And mapping connectivity is 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 so important because we need to know where those holes are and where there are no holes, because that then helps us think, well, on this street, we've only got one garden that's not connected. So again, we could then go and speak to those residents in that house and say, could we make a hole so that, you know, the hedgehog doesn't have to come out and go back in again. It's, getting them off the road that's the most important thing so on the left hand side we've got Boxted Wildlife Group and at an event they got loads of maps out and residents turned up and then they they, they marked on whether they had a hole in their their um, their boundary their garden boundary so again great way to start mapping what you have and again recording all that information on Hedgehog Street is really really important and like Suffolk Wildlife Trust we have a drop down box on that um, website for the hedgehog friendly village project in the Dedham Vale. Um, as Cathy mentioned footprint tunnels this is what one looks like it's a bit like a tobler, black Toblerone and so you put this along a hedge where you expect hedgehogs to to walk and um, yeah you come up with some lovely footprints if you get um, hedgehogs so a really good way to, to know if you, you've got hedgehogs or not that presence or absence and we also have um, we've got quite a few of these which we loaned out to quite a few community groups and we've also got some cameras as well so again we had some great night cam images of hedgehogs which was wonderful um, hedge, hedgehogs, as, as Cathy said, they, they like uh, hedgerows and so a big part of the project in East Burkholt was trying to connect different parts of East Burkholt by planting some hedges. So we had some of our volunteers out doing some hedgerow surveys. So again, those survey volunteers are really, really important and can help you find out what you have and what you can do to improve the landscape around your village or town. So it's really good to gap up and create new hedges. But one of the most important things was to um, train up some practical volunteers. Um, not everybody is able to make a hole in their garden fence or, or wall. And so we trained up some volunteers to be able to do this. So um, that involved going for them to go into a garden, to do a survey, to look at what the risks are within that garden, where the hole is going to go. So that's talking to the resident and the neighbours as well, thinking where the power is just in case we need bigger tools to create holes and getting permissions of the neighbour. Uh, this is um, Phil, one of our volunteers, and he's just created a hole in a, a fence and it's got a barge, a concrete barge board underneath. So he's going to put lots of bricks there so that there is a little stepping, stepping ladder to get to the hole. So in, within this garden, five holes were created because this garden backed onto five different gardens so amazing you know um, area of land that suddenly has become connected for hedgehogs one of the biggest things we're trying to do is to um, encourage people to put a sign up to say hedgehog highway not everyone always stays in their same home so when somebody new comes in it's quite important to let them know that there's a purpose for their hole in the garden in this fence so by having a little plaque or your homemade plaque saying hedgehog highway hopefully people will keep them there so hedgehogs can still go from one garden to the next garden so here's a, a few examples of some of the holes that were created and um, you can see that they can there can be a gap in a hedge there could be under a fence they could be a hole in a barge board all sorts of different types of holes can be created just depends on what your, your garden boundaries are like. One of the things we also did was to um, get the residents who had their hole created to stick a little handprint in their window, their front window, to say we are hedge, hedgehog connected. And that was a great con con conservation conversation piece for people who would turn up and see what that, you know, that that picture in their in their window. And so they could tell them that they've created a hole in their, their fence or their wall so hedgehogs can get through. So increasing that, that connectivity. We're wanting to make hedgehog superhighways. So the more little handprints, the better. 
Um, um, we have quite a few uh, questions in the chat, so I don't know. Um, this yeah. is my last slide. Perfect. OK, so um, finally, um, just quickly again, uh, other things that you can get your um, practical volunteers to do are to build some hedgehog homes. Uh, we also had some signs which we put up around East Burkholt, which was saying about slow down hedgehog area. And we also have volunteers that planted hed um, hedgerows as well. So all sorts of things for all sorts of people. Um, we also work with Suffolk Friendly Vets. They gave us information and flyers. And this, this game was sent out via social media and various written media. Um, so that really, really important to, to have them involved so people know what to do when they do find a poorly hedgehog. And just really to finish off, there's all different ways we can support hedgehog. But the most important thing is that we work together and take collective action to help hedgehogs in whatever small way we can. So the future of hedgehogs is a positive future. OK, I'm going to hand over to Tom. That was great, Emma. It's brilliant to see what we can obviously all do a lot on our own, but actually when we work together, it's amazing how much more can be done, isn't it? Um, there were lots of questions in the chat, which is great. Lots of uh, passionate people, which is fantastic. Probably, um, I won't do them in order. Probably the number one question was around some of the food um, that people supplement um, hedgehogs with. So there was a question, I'm just finding it. Um, uh, the question was, are things like dried worms and sunflower hearts good for hedgehogs um and there was a discussion around mealworms and sunflower seeds and what what the best type of cat and dog food is so perhaps you i know you did touch on it kathy but maybe if you could just just yeah, clarify so maybe. yeah so there were, um basically um hedgehogs are lactose intolerant so you know traditionally people are put out bread and milk but they will eat it they'll lap it up but actually if if that's their only diet that will give them diarrhea and it's it's not very good, healthy for them um mealworms then became something that people were keen to feed them and um, the problem with mealworms and again it's about if that's pretty much a large part of their diet, they can get a bone disorder from it, not so, it sort of presents not so dissimilar to a kind of rickets thing. So, you know, the odd mealworm, probably not a problem, but you don't want to just feed the mealworm. So, so it comes back to the, the general advice is to give them a meaty, so avoid fish because it goes off too quickly, but uh, a meaty cat or dog food is by far the best. Um, but you can also use, um, and a wet food is good, you can use the dry, particularly the kitten nibs they like. Um, but yeah, head, sometimes the hedgehogs will tell you if there's a, if there's sufficient, so if there's a, a a good choice of food, um, then, then they can be selective. But yeah, yeah cat, cat, Wet cat or dog food is, or kitten nibs, is by far the safest thing. And um, the other one is you can buy um, ones that are sold as hedgehog food. Um, the advice still is, though, that that doesn't tend to come with as much testing as food for cats and dogs. Um, but I have heard that spike is quite good. So, so these sort of ones that are sold as hedgehog food, I bought one once and it got crystallised pineapple in, which I really don't know why it was in there. Wasps loved it, hedgehogs ignored it. So yeah, stick with cat or dog okay. food. <laughs> and avoid and avoid the milk. Yeah, avoid the milk and mealworms maybe as part of a mixed diet, but don't just feed the mealworms. Right. Um, we've got a great question from Molly, aged eight, from Sudbury. Uh, she says, I've just made a hedgehog house with my dad. What should I put in it to make it comfy? So Emma, I don't know if you want to take that one. Um, um, I would suggest putting in some some hay. Um, you can buy that from a, 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 a pet shop or if you've got some dried leaves, put them in there. Nothing wet, obviously, but yeah, that'll make it nice and cosy. Perfect. Um, there was just a follow up on the cat food. So someone has pointed out that they're a bit concerned if they put that in the garden, they'll attract all the neighbourhood cats. But did I think you mentioned earlier that you could um, sort of make it hedgehog? Yeah, that you can put it inside inside a container or inside. Yeah, the, there is examples of how to make them on um, Hedgehog Street. 
um, and you can use or cannibalize a plastic tub and you could if you put a tunnel in a small tunnel in it makes it more difficult for things like dogs foxes cats to get to it um, and then yeah the, the reason for using plastic and then we try and avoid plastic but it's easy to clean it out um, so yeah that uh, the, the idea particularly if you put a turn in the tunnel um, that it makes it quite hard for things like cats to wiggle their way in. It's not to say that you won't get things like stoats or weasels taking advantage, but uh, but yeah, it minimises the harm. But I'd come back to um, the best thing you could do is actually have a really uh, good ecosystem in your garden with some long grasses, some flower beds, some shrubberies, um, not using pesticides as much as possible and then actually that will support hedgehogs but yeah I know some people like to feed because it does make things like camera trapping a lot easier and, and people get a lot of pleasure from doing that but yeah if you're concerned that it's just going to be feeding the neighbour's cats <laughs> then, then just go for a really lovely garden. <laughs> okay perfect um, a couple of questions on a similar set of themes so uh, someone says, are lawn and weed feed treatments dangerous to hedgehogs? And also someone's asked about the pesticides. Are that, whilst you mentioned that they obviously um, kill a lot of the things that hedgehogs eat, are they actually harmful themselves to hedgehogs, so pesticides? No, I don't know the direct answer to that, to be honest. Okay. Um, the only thing I would say is that um, the, some of the herbicides, the herbicides are, are treating weeds and so you might think they're not causing a problem because they're not getting rid of the hedgehog's food but there are indirect effects of some of these herbicides so there is evidence that things like herbicides and fungicides actually affect earthworm numbers and earthworms are um, very often a significant portion of a hedgehog's diet so again yeah, try and minimise, try and find alternatives um, where you can or, you know, rejoice the weeds and just name them, re re reframe your brain and think of them as wildflowers. Perfect. Um, so one probably comes back to your, um, some of the things you touched upon, Emma. So someone's asked, where can we get hedgehog warning signs for our estate? We are trying to make it more hedgehog friendly. Where could we get help with this? Um, so the ones that I got for the East Burkle Friendly Village project were from Suffolk Preservation Society. So, um, yeah, if you, if you go on their website, you'll be able to find them there. And they're about, well, I don't know, 30 centimetres by 30 centimetres. So we just put them onto some posts. But yeah, well worth putting a few up. You can also make your own there. I've, I've been through some villages like Steeple Bumps and Genestics and they have their own hedgehog signs. So you can get creative and get some volunteers together and make your own ones. Again, that may stand out a bit more. Perfect. And then I guess, as you were saying, the importance is to try and link up the gardens on an estate as well. So that obviously it's great if you have one hedgehog friendly garden, but if there's no way in or out. The hedgehogs need to be able to come and go so that's the, the key i guess is like some of the things you said postcards speaking to neighbors getting a, sort of te a team approach yeah the key messages are increase that connectivity and be more you know nature friendly gardening is is just crucial perfect and um, there was a quick someone's asked a question uh joy asked um i'm oh, sorry not joy um elliot asked a question about you mentioned not to probably try and avoid the wicker hedgehog hides. Could you just explain why why that is? It, it, um, it, the, the understanding is that, and, and it's not something I've got personal experience of, but is 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 the advice is that their prickles could get caught in them, um, particularly the, the wicker ones. So yeah, so the, the wooden ones are absolutely fine and they probably give them a lot more security and a lot longer lasting. Um, but yeah, and the, and with the hedgehog boxes, the wooden ones are are are, are really good on the whole. Um, the advice is to have a dividing wall inside or a tunnel again to to protect them a bit from predation. 
um, and for the entrance not to be sort of facing out into the open, but perhaps along a hedge line or um, a wall or something um, that they're more likely to use it. But they are regularly taken up. The hedgehogs will regularly use them, um, particularly for nesting, slightly less so for hibernation. And then you can cover them in some some logs or some brash um, to sort of make them a little bit more protected as well, and a little bit more naturalistic yeah, looking. Yeah. Um we had a question from Karen. So she says, how do we protect hedgehogs from badgers? We are releasing hedgehogs at the University of Essex from a local rescue centre and we have badgers on campus. Mm. Sorry, I put you on the spot there. It is a really, really difficult one. Um, a lot of the time, hedgehog rescue people won't release hedgehogs where there are big badger populations. Um, but if there's a really good landscape where hedgehogs and badgers can move around the landscape without being less likely to bump into each other they can coexist and uh, if you overlay the records of hedgehogs in Suffolk with the records of badgers in Suffolk we can see that actually there are hedgehogs where there are badgers so they're not mutually exclusive and hedgehogs will um, sometimes avoid foraging where there are badgers um, but it will ultimately be the decision of the hedgehog rescue people whether they're willing to you know to, re to release them there. Badgers are fully protected under British law um, so um, you, you would have to sort of live with your badgers I think <laughs> unless you've got really good reason you'd then have to go through a lot of um, permissions um, to exclude badgers and I, I think an exclusion on the basis of releasing hedgehogs would, my guess and I'm guessing here is unlikely to be granted it would have to be for, for some reason that they're undermining a, rail, a railway line or a road or something pretty drastic for an exclusion license to be granted so yeah make the habitat really as rich and and for so that the animals can move around the, around the landscape it's getting coming back to that connected landscape it's really vital for, for them to be able to coexist right thank you uh, Emma, I've got one for you. So this was submitted in advance. So it's what can schools do to attract hedgehogs? And I guess just r raise awareness of hedgehogs to to uh, children in the schools. Yeah, so, you know, having, you know, experts coming and talking about hedgehogs. But the most important thing is to make sure that your head that your school grounds are hedgehog friendly. So, yeah, lots of longer grass, you know, log piles, lots of dead wood, lots of shrubs, you know, flowers, you know, all things that hedgehog want to eat, but also making sure that the, the school grounds are connected to the landscape around. So whether that's gardens or with another open space. Yeah. So again, the connectivity is really, really important. And, you know, certainly the schools that I've worked in over many years, you know, I've done a lot of school grounds development and it is all about, you know, that nature friendly gardening and just letting things be a bit more untidy. You know, uh, hedgehogs really love rootling around and, you know, through log piles, leaves. So, yeah, just leaving, leaving, leaving some of that stuff around, really. And, you know, celebrating that stuff, because that is where you're going to get the wildlife in the rough areas. You're not going to get wildlife in short grass. So, yeah, make an effort to create habitat in your in your school grounds. Perfect. I think we've got time for a couple more. So there was one uh, from Tom. He said, I work on a 300 acre heath golf course. Is it worth putting some hedgehog houses out or not? We see them in the evenings. So on a big scale like that, is it still worth putting the homes out? I I would suggest not. I, I think, you know, it's just making sure that there is habitat there for them to to nest and hibernate. And, and yeah, I, I mean, there's nothing wrong with putting the hedgehog box out there, but you know it's again finding somewhere where it can be disguised, so it's not you can, you know it's not so visible, particularly with people you know rootling around to try and find the golf balls. You don't want them to suddenly come along, come across a, you know a hedgehog box and then think what's in there. So yeah, you know you can put hedgehog boxes up, but again disguise them, log piles, make it into a feature, you know have some interpretation on it information saying this is this is for hedgehogs so again you're educating people that's a great way of doing it if you're in a you know a, a place like that um but yeah you know 
if you've got them and they're running around, it means that they're finding places to nest. So yeah, you're very lucky. Okay. Um, just to sum up, I'm going to put you both on the spot and say, what would you, if people leave here tonight with one or two things, the key takeaway messages, what would, what would they be? Oh, for me, it would, so for me, it would be create hedgehog highways with your neighbour, open up your gardens and let the hedgehogs through, get them off the roads. Yeah, that's I'd, I'd, I'd second that as well. And I think the other thing is that it will if we've got hedgehogs, then our gardens will support a lot of other wildlife. And the thing that hedgehogs need and a lot of other is really, really important for so many other um, wildlife creatures that we enjoy in our gardens, like small garden birds, is those insects, is, is those invertebrates absolutely crucial. Um, you know, things like a, a great tip blue tit, was it something like 10,000 caterpillars they reckon that uh, they need to rear a brood? So if you're helping hedgehogs, then you're you're welcoming a lot of other what garden wildlife as well. So yeah, thank you. Perfect. Okay. Well, thanks very much for everyone for coming along. Um, I will send round um, afterwards. Um, the event has been recorded, so I will send out the recording so that you can watch it back or share it with, with your neighbour to get them to uh, make that hole um, in their fence. Um, I think that was everything I had to say. There'll be a short, I'll also send out a short uh, survey, which would be great if you could fill in, because we'd love to organise more of these in the future. So if you could let us know how we did, but also um, maybe any other topics you'd like us to cover in the future, um, that would be great. So thanks a lot, everyone. Um, see you soon. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Good Bye. luck with it all.